I am so excited to be here um, with you all and um, obviously with this special guest who I actually referred to as the nightingale of empowering humans to greatness in mindset and financial freedom. And that is the amazing Sharon Lecter. Great morning, world. Welcome to the Rise Up with Dragon podcast with your host, Dragon. Get into the float state with Calmer Mind Meditations and Gear. Great morning, world. This is your boy Dragon coming to you after a long trip to uh, South Africa, and um, somehow uh, time stamp. This is during the uh, the Omicron um, thing, which ironically, somebody told me the other day that if you um, take the word Omicron and you mix it up, it actually spells moronic. Um, which I thought was fun. But uh, yeah, so we we just went out there to, to visit our little girl and we just came back and we're just so grateful for the time away. But I am so excited to be here um, with you all and um, obviously with this special guest. Um, so just a couple of quick things before I bring um, who I actually referred to as the nightingale of empowering humans to greatness in mindset and financial freedom. Um, very, very special human being that's doing just wonderful, wonderful things for you and I. Um, and I'm just in a state of gratitude that she's found some time in her busy schedule to be with us in the Dragon's Lair. Um, and that is the amazing Sharon Lecter. So I'm going to bring Sharon out here. Hey, Sharon, how are you? Let's get you unmuted. There. I'm fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be with you. And awesome. I love that tagline, Nightingale. I love it. <laughs> Do you know where Nightingale comes from? Well, you tell me. So it's Florence Nightingale. Um, right. and, and it was during, I guess, during wartime where she came in and she she kind of played the role of a nurse. Right. So caretaker. it's actually, caretaker. Yeah, caretaker. Yeah, caretaker. So, you know, it's kind of like when, when I whenever I see you on stage or had the opportunity to get to know you better, and I want to remind everybody how that how I met you, um, I kind of look at you like that. Like, you know, the there's one it's one thing to help people grow. And it's one thing to be successful, but um, you can tell when somebody actually cares. And uh, so, yeah, Nightingale, feel, well, feel free to use it. You Hashtag. just made my day and my week. Appreciate awesome. that. Awesome. Well, thanks. it's true. I do care about people. That's why I do what I do. Yeah. And that's probably why you're here with a guy named Dragon right now. <laughs> um, so just just quickly, um, I met, now I'm, I've obviously followed Sharon for quite some time and, you know, read a bunch of her books and stuff. And in the intro, you know, extensively, she's done some amazing, amazing things. And we're going to get into that. But I had the opportunity to share the stage with her. She was a featured speaker. And I was I was one of the mere mortals at this event in Colorado. But what was cool is I got to sit at Sharon's table. Um, and I was talking to chicken, my wife, and here's my a picture of my wife right here. Um, but uh, we were just saying, you know, like, Sharon Lecter is actually really cool. And we don't get to say that about people all the time, but like we were hanging out and just getting really to know some people um, at this event. And Sharon has these great friends and her assistant and her coworkers and her assistant's not really her assistant. She's like her best friend. Um, so I just want to say that uh, we don't say that about a lot of people, but um, Sharon is like, is a super, super cool person. And that's kind of probably where the Nightingale thing started. Um, so what I want to I want to kick this off, Sharon, because I, I mean, like, how do you how do you take thirty minutes, forty minutes, and like have a conversation with somebody that's done as much as you? So I'm going to do the best that I can to serve um, this audience in the way that I know that they like to be served. But what I love about meeting successful people, um, and it, at different phases of my life. I've, I've been through different phases of success. So I find myself in a state of success right now. But what I love about meeting people that sometimes we're enamored by is I love the fact that at some point they weren't like that. Um, at some point they started the way 
a listener might be starting right now. And I know a lot of our listeners probably know that there's greatness inside of them, but they probably also carry a lot of concepts that maybe not them, or maybe it's not the right time for them and things like that. So I use the word spark. Um, we don't need to know about the red shiny bike that you got when you were a kid or the fact that you were born, but let's go into a different realm. When did Sharon Lecter first recognize maybe that there was greatness in, in her and you started this journey that's led you to also help other people? If you can go back to maybe a place that you haven't talked about, or maybe you're loaded with this. Well, thank you so much. I think you know, you, there's, I had parents who said you can do anything you want if you just put your effort into it. And I started my career at a time when women, there weren't very many women in business. But I remember my eighth grade English teacher telling me I'd be a famous writer. Now I was in all about math and accounting. And my eighth grade teacher said, you're going to be a famous writer. I thought she was crazy. And then when I was in college in my accounting degree, my house mother told me that I'd be on stage. All right. So those things planted seeds in my brain that Somebody saw something possible for me. And I started my career in public accounting. And it was probably three and a half years into that, 25 years old. And I realized that I had grown up in a very entrepreneurial environment. I lived in a small house between my mom's beauty shop, my dad's used car, car lot. We owned rental properties that I scrubbed out bathrooms between tenants. And I swore I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. But after three and a half years in public accounting, when I was not in control of my own schedule, all of a sudden my parents started looking a lot smarter. And that's when I made the decision. I had a client invite me to go with him into a company. And I'm, you know, I, I sat down with the old yellow, yellow legal pad, because this is before PCs, before cell phones, and did the pros and cons. And it didn't help. I could argue both sides, but my hand kind of took across and wrote across the top of the page, why not? And that is still my philosophy many, many years later. Why not do something different? Why not take the road less traveled? Why not solve a problem or serve a need? And why not me? And I think what you say, every listener, every viewer right now, you were made perfect to be you, not someone else but you have been given the ability to create something here on earth. I had parents who asked me every single night, Sharon, did you add value to someone's life today? They've been gone for many years, but I still ask myself that every single night. And so when you talk about spark, it's somebody's planted a seed in you. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. And you have to find that light for yourself and become your own beacon of light and know that you have every opportunity to create success. And you know what? It's never too late. You're never too old. I get a lot of that. I'm just too old. No, never too, never too late to refire, to find that brilliance of what you want. And so there's been things throughout my career that helped me refocus on what I wanted. But it was that see that I could do it if I worked hard enough that has never failed me. Question on that. Um, because I think, I think everybody can probably go back and I mean, hopefully I shouldn't say everybody, but everybody can kind of like remember that moment that somebody told me, told them that they could do something, but for whatever reason you heard it. Um, so, you know, there must've been something unique about that time. One, one thing that I'm curious about is why, because I've been learning so much about you and I can understand how your, your black belt is strong in, in money and th from accounting, but why did you choose that? Do you, do you remember what, what was, what was it that attracted you to that? As a well, when I was in elementary school, I wanted to be a fourth grade math teacher because I love my math teacher in fourth grade. And so, but then when I got to college, I was actually double track. I was in genetics and I was in accounting. And genetics was going to be eight years in school. Accounting was four. And so my sophomore, junior year, I made the decision, I'm going to finish in accounting. And, um, and, I, and I really loved the business side of it. And so that's really why I went that way. And then if I'm going to be in accounting, then I need to have that designation at CPA. And so that was the, the path that I chose. But 
the gift that it gave me was in public accounting. I had the opportunity to see hundreds of businesses, many of them seeing how they were successful, what they did to become success. But equally as important, the number of businesses that I worked with or I saw where they screwed up. And learning that gave me such a incredible street smart ability to help other people and to help people grow their businesses from where they are today to where they need to be through scaling and creating those systems to build them. You know, it's something that just made sense to me now, because, um, you know, you got to definitely follow Sharon on, uh, on her socials and Instagram and stuff. And I just watched a video that spoke to that. And now I understand where it comes from. It's just this concept of everybody's chasing the money, but having money and managing it is totally different. And now I realize why you're so passionate about that is because because of that experience, I feel like everybody should go become an accountant before they become successful now, or or just speak to you, um, because that you know you've you had the opportunity to see a lot of people that had a lot of money that mismanaged it. And oh, your numbers tell a story, yeah. just like writing a book. Your financial statements tell a story, and uh, that can sometimes be very revealing. <laughs> So Sharon, you've done, you know, so many things. I, I think one really fascinating um, thing that that happened is I believe it was around 2008 that I, I'd love to find out how this happened. Because here, by the way, you know, I've got um, this book right here, Outwitting the Devil, um, which is a super cool book. But when you just figure out what it's about, because I mean, when you read this title, who knows how you digest it, but when you find out what this book is about, you're going to just going to be rocked. Um, but like how in two, th there's just talk about the worlds and the and planets being aligned. How in 2008, just, I don't know if it was before, during or, or after that, just the craziness that ensued. How did that unfold where the Napoleon Hill foundation reached out to you and brought you in? Um, and, was there some sort of weird correlation timing wise about that? I mean, were you, I, I almost feel like you were brought in as the nightingale to save the world or something like that at that time. Thank you. I, I, I love that. I'm going to use that. I appreciate that. Um, well, I had built the rich debt organization over 10 years, 1997 to 2007. And the reason I made the decision to leave, I you know, was equal partners with Robert. I was co-author on the 15 books we did together, but we were no longer aligned in what we wanted from the company. He wanted to go into franchising, which was a great model for us. It wasn't a good model for the franchisees. And I could not um, I, I just wasn't the, the right place for me. So I made that decision in March of 07 to, to separate and it, it got a little messy, but in that process, I did not know what was ahead of me. And so I tell everybody, sometimes you have to close one door for other doors of opportunity to open. But I knew that I had to do that for, to be true to who I was to, and to stand in my own power and my own truth. So I made that decision to leave. And it was that fall when I got the call from President Bush asking me to be on the President's Advisory Council for Financial Literacy, which I served both President Bush and President Obama. But it was the following March of 08, we know what's happening in the economy, when Don Green reached out to me. And he and I knew each other because we were in the same industry. We knew each other from book fairs. And I read Think and Grow Rich when I was 19. But he reached out because he had recently learned that I had left the Rich Dad organization and he wanted to help in revitalizing the words and the teachings of Napoleon Hill, given what was happening in the economy. Because most young people, and my definition of young is now 50 or under, um, did not know Napoleon Hill, did not know Think and Grow Rich. So we wanted to bring his wisdom to a younger audience. And it was an incredible honor to get that call. Now understand, I would never have gotten either of those calls, the President's Call or Napoleon Hill Foundation, had I still been at Rich Dad. And I share that because I wanna to reiterate to everybody watching and listening, is there a door in your life you need to close so other doors of opportunity open? Because I, you know, I, I thought Rich Dad was my legacy. And when I made the decision to leave, I wasn't sure what was ahead of me, but I knew I had to do what was right for me. And, and God, the world said, no, you've got so much more. And so 
be, being on the President's Advisory Council, working with the Napoleon Hill Foundation, helped me really establish Sharon Lecter. And after having built the largest personal finance brand, to be asked to step into the world's largest personal development brand and revitalize it was an incredible honor and one that I cherish. And then, of course, the book you just held up, being asked to look at this manuscript that had been locked away for 73 years, where I was literally reading a hand-typed um, manuscript with handwritten notes in the margin. It was like I was having a conversation with Napoleon Hill. It was incredible. Because I, I think I was probably only the fourth or fifth person to actually read the manuscript. And once I read it, I knew I knew it had to come out. God, what a what an honor. What an honor. And and you know it's interesting about doors opening and closing. I think most people are probably looking for when you when you make that statement it's powerful to hear that she said, is there a door that you need to close so that another can open? I think a lot of people are looking for open doors without understanding the process that sometimes needs to take place. Um, super, super cool. So I, I'm just, you know, thinking about that and, you know, the, the, what it says, just, just one powerful thing if, when you get this book and, and all, all of the information about finding out you know, where to get Sharon's stuff, anything she's involved in will be in the notes. But it says here on the top of the book, it says, this This is all I needed. I mean, at the event, Sharon, I think, gave this to me. And, uh, you know, I was like, cool, I'm going to read it just because Sharon's involved in it. But, but then I turned it over and it says, fear is the tool of a man-made devil. And I said, whoa, you know, that concept of this thing, whatever you you call it, this thing that you claim is is holding you back or whatever, and just that concept of man made. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit about this concept of fear holding you back. Because what I what I heard you, you know, and and by the way, I hope that you wrote this down when she says like, why not, you know. Um, because most of the time, I think what, what's screwing us up is that we're using our minds to move forward rather than checking with our gut and our heart and things like that. Because um, those are some scary things that you went through that ended up being blessings. But talk a little bit about that. I heard you speak about that before, about you know why is it that fear or that we allow fear to hold us back? Well, let me start with the first book that I went with, um, helped with the Napoleon Hill Foundation called Three Feet from Gold. And in it, we released a personal success equation. And that personal success equation is P plus T, which is passion plus talent. And most of us stop there. We think we have to do everything on our own. But true success comes from combining your passion and your talent times association. Who's around you? Who's on your team? Do you have a mentor? Do you have people that are strong where you are weak? And then times A, taking action. How many times do we know what we're supposed to do? We just don't do it. And then there's that plus F, and that F is faith. Faith in yourself, faith in what you're doing, faith that is needed and necessary. And way too many times, I do a lot of mentoring, and it's the power of association and that faith, self-confidence, that usually need the most work, and they go hand in hand. You can go to personalsuccessequation.com to get a guide that I created um, to help you identify your own personal success equation. But too often that F is not faith, it's fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of failure, fear of poverty, fear of old age, fear of loss of love. Those are fears that uh, Napoleon Hill talks about in Outwitting the Devil. And I think the fear of criticism is a huge one in today's world. We're so paranoid about what other people think about us, that we don't stand in our own power. And so in Outwitting the Devil, he talks about how to get rid and shed that fear, figure out where it came from. And he talks about seven steps to be able to get rid of that fear. Yeah, it's, it's so, it, and it's so interesting to think about the fact that the fear it is man-made as well. Um, but I, I guess what, what I'm, here's the, the, here's the thing I want to pick your brain about. If somebody makes a decision, a fundamental decision that they want to be rich or successful or whatever they call it, um, and they take the extra step of, you know, connecting it to things that matter most and they make it this 
as you said, I love the way she, she, she says assets are sexy. So they make their goals sexy. Um, and all of that stuff that we know are, is important, but then they'll go back and allow fear to hold them back. I mean, does fear have that much power that it can have somebody within an hour of making a fundamental decision to go and putting everything into it and then all of a sudden stop? Like, why is it that people allow that you know, fear to take the place of faith, you know, and, and also what I'd love to hear from you is like, what's the, what's the step that they need to take to address that? Well, fear does one of two things. Fear paralyzes you or motivates you, fight or flight, right? So I think most people are paralyzed by fear. You want to turn off the lights, get under the covers and just hope, put your head in the sand and hope it goes away. And that's what we have to stop. We have to identify where that fear is coming from. Sometimes it's from something that happened in our childhood and turn that fear into energy and into motivation. And that motivation can help you take that next step and transfer that fear into faith. And I think the very first step, as Napoleon talks about, is it really having that definiteness of purpose, knowing what you're on this planet to do. And that helps you take it outside of yourself. And when you take it outside of yourself, then you can deal with that fear. So for me, my passion and my talent, my passion was anger that we weren't teaching kids about money in school. My talent was years in accounting, my years in publishing, so I could combine those. But my definiteness of purpose came when I understood the power of what I knew and how I could help other people take control of their lives. And so in the morning when I wake up, I know my purpose. And it takes me outside, helps me get out of bed. So knowing that definiteness of purpose is so important to help you deal with the fear. And then surrounding yourself with the right people helps you get focused. Because when you have the right people around you and you have a bad day, they won't let you stay down. They bring you up. And that's so important in today's environment. So just like the closing of the doors, um, if we make, if, if that's our goal and we've set, and we've set a goal to create that structure, um, part of that is to identify the wrong people that, you know, we might need to kindly ask. And sometimes it's family. Often it's family. Yes. Um, well, exactly. And the seven steps that we talk about in Outwitting the Devil, the first one is definiteness of purpose. The second one is mastery over self, taking control of who you are, you know, your thoughts, words, and actions. The third one is learning from adversity, understanding that bad things happen. They are occurrences, not definitions. You learn from those adversity. But then it's control over your environment. And that's exactly what you're talking about. Who is in your space? Who are you allowing in your head? Who are you spending your time with? Are they people? And are you listening and, do, and reading things that are propelling you forward? Or are you spending time with people who hold you back? And you're right, often it's your own family. And I go, there's something I call put the cone of protection on because your family understand that they're trying to pull you back, but realize it's probably not because of you. They're seeing you taking action to better yourself, to move forward, and they're not. And so they're feeling bad about themselves. And as such, they're lashing out, trying to pull you back. And that's where if you can understand that, put that cone of protection and keep moving forward, surrounding yourself with people who want to support you, who want you to succeed, who can open new doors for you, have that mentor. That's what's going to create that success that you so richly deserve. And then mastery over your time. Are you spending time or are you investing time? Each of us can really sit back and say, okay, I have five hours a week I can dedicate to something new, to buy, build, or create an income producing asset. Your time, you know, we have, we make money, lose it, make it back. Once your time is gone, you don't get it back. And so understanding, invest your time in the future allows you to get rid of the fear because you are on definiteness of purpose with the right people around you. You've got that self-discipline. And what happens is that, you know, the sixth step is, is harmony. Right, because you've done all those first five things, it becomes easier and easier. And then check in every single day. Use a little caution to make sure that you're still on track to control the thoughts, words, and actions 
to create and achieve the success that you so richly deserve. I just can't imagine what that was like for you to uncover that, like when you read when you're reading the handwriting, <laughs> and say, "Oh my God," you know, and then and then annotate that. I see, you know, there's some people commenting, and it, apparently, I, I I've got the book, but um, Nando says that you uh, actually narrated the audible of it as well, which must be pretty cool. Must be pretty cool. Um, you know, one of the things that I do is, you know, I I won't just read a book by Sharon Lecter; is I'll read it and rewrite it you know, myself, just for my own to just take ownership of it. And then I'll go speak about what I learned from it. But to actually annotate that book must have been a like a super highway for you to own that material to the point where, you know, you're sharing it so passionately. That must have been amazing. Well, it was. And it's, it's interesting because there are every once in a while we have a diehard Napoleon Hill fan who criticizes my annotations. And it's like, we talk about it in the very beginning of the book as I share we wanted to bring Napoleon Hill's words to the to the modern reader who weren't aware of him. And so my annotations compare when this book was written in 1938 to modern times to give kind of a comparison. And I made sure my comments are in a different type font. They're set apart so that if you were a diehard Hill fan, you can read it without reading my parts. But you just can't please everybody. But um, it is, you know, I really, I get so much fantastic feedback from people who really appreciate the fact that the comments that I make, because it does compare 1938 to now. And I think that book was, you know, my, Napoleon Hill's wife was afraid of the title. She worked for the Presbyterian College. And so she forbid it to be published. And it was locked away in the vault for 73 years. But I believe there was a higher power at work because I believe outwitting the devil was truly meant for today. So fascinating. Uh, I'll tell you something really strange. I mean, I guess it would be strange in, as, in accordance with the way people think, but I, 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 for me, it made sense. I'm in South Africa just a week ago, talking to, you know, Angela about this podcast interview and stuff like that. And while I'm typing and responding to an email from Angela, I look to my left and my father-in-law, who's from South Africa, who had never heard about the book before, it was given to him by somebody else as a gift, was reading Think and Grow Rich. And I'm like, oh, actually, no, we were on a plane. And I, when I was typing, we were going to Cape Town. And I looked at him and I'm like, where'd you get that? And, and he's, you know, in this South African accent, he's like, it's like this book is great, man. You know, it was just like so. It's just so weird that that happened. Um, let's talk a little bit about this this big movement that you're that you're involved in right now, because you know this idea of playing big right now. It it just seems that the way you know when I read your profile and things like that, it says Sharon's back now and she's playing a big game, as if you ever stopped. But it seems like you've got a new breath right now and in where you're going. Just speak a little bit about this play big movement. I love the way it sounds. Sure. The play big movement is, it stands for being number one in your field, living your legacy. You, you create your legacy every single day with every heart you touch and creating maximum impact. And I originated it because um, I started the talking children's book industry, built that around the world, started Rich Dad, built that around the world, um, helped reinvigorate Napoleon Hill. But it, um, nine years ago this month, I lost my youngest son. And you're not supposed to outlive your kids. And it sent me into a world of neutral. I lived my, my life total in a world of numb. And it was probably five or six years ago when I finally thought, you know, maybe I should just retire. And I got a lot of pushback from family and friends. And even heard him in my ear saying, get over it, mom, there's more for you to do. And I realized, particularly the last couple of years, everybody watching and listening, we've had things that stopped us in our tracks. And we need to realize that we're still here. We're still here for a reason. And whatever we've been through can help others going through it if we just share our story. And so when I made the decision to play big again for me, I had been playing small, living in neutral. The world of opportunities had always been there. I was invited into the Think and Grow Rich Legacy movie. I was invited into the TV show, World's Greatest Motivators. I have my new books coming out. 
And it was because I made myself open to the possibilities. And I said, well, if I'm going to do this, I don't want to do it alone. I want to share what's happened to me. I want to share this with people who truly understand that they need to be playing a bigger game. And so I created this Facebook page. It's free to join. And it's just totally organic. People coming there are saying, I want to play a bigger game. I want to be number one in my field. I want to live my legacy. I want to create maximum impact. And along with that, I created an online program called the Play Big Movement that takes you through the elements of building the structure building your reputation, your authority, and how to find those right associations to create maximum impact in your life. I love it. Um, in my in my office, which what I'm looking at right now, and if I turn my computer around, I'll probably screw everything up. Um, but it's a big picture of Martin Luther King. And uh, what your that idea of play big movement, you know, I'm just reminded of uh, he refers to the fact that we're all born with what he called the drum major instinct. Um, and I think that just so beautiful, it, you know, Valerie Bercier says that you gave her goosebumps um, when you said playing in neutral. I think everybody can resonate with that. But when you're playing in neutral, it doesn't mean that you don't have the play big movement in you or that drum major instinct, but you kind of it's a voluntary thing, I would assume, when you go into play. Well, it comes back to the fear that you've allowed fear to make you small. And um, you've withdrawn from playing at the level that you're used to or that you are capable of. And once you recognize that, then you can release it and, and really reach out to play that bigger game. Yeah. It's just, I think the most valuable thing that a human being can learn how to do is to become more conscious, self-conscious, self-aware. Was, was that you that, that noticed that on your own or did you have some help from some friends or mentors that kind of like helped you see that you were playing in neutral or did you need some time in neutral? Um, I, well, I needed that time to grieve. It was obviously, you're not supposed to outlive your kids. And um, I, I, I really did just withdraw. Um, and was coasting. And I think um, it was when I may actually was seriously considering um, just stopping and doing something completely different. When I realized I started getting things sent to me about the impact I'd made on people's lives. And then I started my mentoring program. I had not done one-on-one -on -one mentoring prior to that. And that's what saved me because I started my master mentor program where I work with business owners one-on-one. -on -one. And it started filling up part of that hole in my heart because they all kind of like became my kids. They called Mike and I mama and Papa Lecter, right? Um, and so how, feeling that f being fed by working with individuals one-on-one -on -one made me realize that I still had more to do. And, and that's why I made the decision to create the programs and to be out there more and to start speaking more because I know my life experience is something that can help people. And it was once I was on a, I was in Copenhagen on, speaking to 1500 people and I had not talked about losing my son on stage, and yet I was in a Q&A interview session, and the interviewer asked me what was the worst thing that ever happened to me. Now, it was supposed to be, what's the worst business thing that's ever happened to you? But that wasn't the question. And so in front of 1,500 people, I shared the fact that I'd lost my son, not having intended to do that. And I had over 200 people standing in line waiting to talk to me when I got off stage. And I realized at that moment how important it is to be vulnerable and how important it is to share because people can relate to you. And it was at that moment, pretty much, I had made this decision I needed to launch the Play Big Movement and be really open about this. And certainly in the last couple of years, a lot of people have been through tough times and you're not alone. Reach out, let us support you. Man, that's so powerful. Commonality. Um, a lot of people, you know, if you look at all these things that you've, you know, that have happened um, to you or for you, um, a lot of people say God works in mysterious ways, but does he, you know, um, I, I've always looked at it as that, you know, if you're conscious and you're aware, 
Because that's what I believe you really did during those movements. You know, I mean, like you heard a question the way you you heard it, and and it prompted you to say things. But I just feel like we're always being guided and supplied with everything that we need to move forward. But sometimes we we sometimes we need or unconsciously rest in neutral. So powerful, powerful. Ah, so much fun. Tell me a little bit about because um, at at the event you were also talking about exiting rich. Um, mm-hmm. The word rich is as controversial as devil, you know what I mean? Because it just gets received, however. Um, tell me a little bit about what that means. That's another great, great book that everybody, it's called Exit Rich. Big. It, it's actually, your color is definitely red. I mean, Sharon Lecter's color <laughs> is definitely red. And she's So it comes in red and, and white, I guess, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. So tell me a little bit about what that means to exit rich, because it sounds sexy, like an asset. Um, but I think that knowing that Sharon is also teaching people how to manage their life and money is, is a little bit different to the word rich. What's that about? Well, when you start your business, do you A, start it so that you work until the day you die? Or B, do you start it so that you can create something that's successful, that creates financial freedom for yourself and your family, so that one day you can actually get your time back? B, everybody says B, but 99% of the people build A. They don't know how to build the structure of their business so that it can scale. I want you to have a successful business that's sustainable, scalable, and saleable. Now, exit rich can be your time. You bring in the right management team and you still own the company, but you're getting your time back. Exit Rich can be an outright sale of your business. But in order to get the maximum profit for your business, you need to have the right structure. So Exit Rich walks you through a 6P process of building your business to the point where you can get maximum price for your business, but also maximum impact for your business. And it starts number one with people. Who do you have on your team? Do you make sure you have people on your team that are strong where you are weak? Are you, do you try to do everything yourself? Do you have a mentor? The second one, of course, is your product. Do you, can you leverage your product, multiple products in multiple geographic, multiple industries, understanding how to leverage what you've got and then processes. Your business systems, that's how you scale. Do you have those codified? Do you have those processes outlined? Because that's how you can sell a business. Take it outside of people into processes. And then proprietary. Your competitive advantage, your intellectual property. Have you identified it? Have you protected it? Have you leveraged it? And that's so important. That's my superpower, helping people identify their intellectual property, their proprietary, their competitive advantage. Because many times that valuation is not on your balance sheet. That's what they call goodwill, intangible assets. And then the fifth one is your patrons, your database. And in today's world, as you well know, people are brag about their Instagram, their followers on Facebook, but you don't own those. Those are great lead generation, but you need to invite them home into your database because one of your greatest intellectual property assets is your database, making sure you continue to grow and nurture those. And then the sixth one is profits. Many times people want more profit, but the profit is a sign of one of those other P's not being in process. And so I go right to the heart of the matter of things to look at, things to fine tune, things to add value to your business by taking people through that 6P process in Exit Rich. And my co-author is a top female business broker in the country. So between the two of us, we have a depth of industry knowledge, experience, and opportunity for people. Well, you just made me confront and recognize the difference between the followers that I have and how many people are on my newsletter list. <laughs> it's quite different. Um, oh, that's so valuable. And uh, what a, what an amazing, amazing thing to think about. So two questions. These are rise up with dragon questions as we come to the end. Um, because as I started this off, you know, you're, you're seeing Sharon in what most people could probably call a polished state, meaning she's getting a lot of accolades for all the work that she's done, but she started just like you, right? So everybody has that. But 
right now in the play big movement um, and where you're at right now, by the way, I, I wrote down a bunch of notes. One of them is that if you're 50 and under, you're still young because I'm 50. So that was a huge thank <laughs> yes, you. You gave me back the nightingale. Um, what, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Because for me, everybody assumes that because of the way I present myself and I, and I go about life, I think everybody assumes that when I wake up, Julie Andrews, you know, sweeps through the room and cartoon birds fly on my fingers. Um, for me, I wake up often in a, in a state of panic and, and, and concern and worry. And then my morning structure is what gets me in, in line. Um, what I'd like to know about is what gets Sharon Lecter out of bed in the morning? What's the motivation that gets you out of bed in the morning? What well, comes back to definiteness of purpose. There are days when I just want to roll over and go back to sleep. There are days when I don't want to get up and exercise. And I just remind myself of why I'm here on this earth. And I'm 67. So um, you, know, you look at, I'm in the last quarter of my life and it's like, okay, I need to you know, accomplish more. I need to feel, continue to add value to people's lives every single day. And so in the morning when it's like, I want to, I, I'll let myself roll over and then I think, got to go. Got more to do. Um, you know, it's, sleep is sometimes underrated, but sometimes it's also overrated. Get up, get your day started and see what kind of people you can impact during the day. Speaking of sleep, um, Chicken and I, and I'm very proud of myself right now for doing this because I'm experiencing like brain altering jet lag right now. But we, we got up at 1am last night. And I was so I, I've been working at this podcast episode and, and uh, interview since 1am, because we just couldn't sleep. Um, that's so so powerful, you know, just that definite of purpose. If you don't have that def definite of purpose, you're not going to be able to say, hey, we just got to go, you're going to say it's an option. It's an option. Um, but when there's, you know, I always say, if you struggle with understanding how important it is to have a what and a why and a definitive purpose, if I push somebody's head under water, I say, what do you want? And they say air. And I go, how bad, you know, is there anything that will prevent you from trying to get that? And they go, oh, okay, I get it. So I would assume that Sharon's definitive purpose in this play big movement is her air right now and probably a lot more to it. Um, so last question, Sharon, and before we close this up, this is a question I ask everybody is, what is Sharon Lecter most afraid of? Interesting question. What am I most afraid of? Yes, a lot of people respond by saying interesting question. <laughs> well, because I teach people about fear, um, I, I'm going to share my definition of worry with you. To worry, which I happen to be a champion worrier, to worry is to pray for what you do not want. And that definition changed my life over 10 years ago, and I share it all the time. So I catch myself still in a worry storm, and I stop, and that's fear-based. And I stop myself, and I go, okay, Sharon, instead of focusing on what I don't want, I change my thought process and focus on what I do want. And so in answer to your question, when something comes and causes me fear, I stop and go, okay, where's that coming from? And how can I reframe my brain to focus on a positive outcome to try and deal with that fear? Um, and I will tell you, losing a child redefines what stresses you out things that used to stress me out don't anymore. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was in the British Virgin Islands on a private island, and I ended up with a major nosebleed, which ended up having to have some um, sinus surgery. And it was the most fear, I because I actually was in fear of my life that night. And it was like, wow, I haven't had experienced this level of fear in a long time. Because losing a child redefines. So I, I don't find myself in fear too often. When I do though, I do, I exercise the thought process of, okay, I'm fearful that this is going to happen, but you can only control what you think, act, and say. And so I retool it and say, what do I want to have happen in lieu of that? 
and focus on that. So I, I really try to repel fear and adjust it into focus on creating the best outcome. Yeah, kind of use it as an ingredient rather than something that screws things up. And I, and I will say that, and I have to let people know this, a little side sidetrack or behind the scenes stuff that when that happened to Sharon, um, we were actually supposed to have our interview, I think the next day or two days later, which would have been a big challenge considering she was contemplating death. <laughs> but she, she said that she was going to, she would have done it anyway. So, uh, that, that's just another testament to the nightingale. Um, Sharon, so awesome, you know, and, and I want everybody that's listening here. If one of the things that I, that I say in my intro is, is that if you, you know, are hearing Sharon's name for the first time and you think you didn't know her, you do, you just didn't know you did. Um, she's just done so many, so many things. Um, and I, and I'm going to invite you just go Google her for one thing, like her website, SharonLector.com. But if you Google her, you'll get connected to a, about a bunch of different interviews, you know, um, that are just stellar, you know, you'll learn so much about her. Um, but it'll show up in the show notes. But a couple of action steps is um, pick a book that resonates with you and start with that one. Could be Exit Rich, could be, you know, Outwitting the Devil. I mean, there's so many. And if you've never read, read Think and Grow Rich or uh, or Rich Dad Poor Dad, I mean, no brainer. Buy them, buy them now. Um, go to her website. The Personal Success Equation is a great is a cool tool because first of all, it's uh, it's free. <laughs> it's it's a guide, um, but it's a great great way to experience Sharon um, in uh, in some of her brilliance and give you some of these like action steps that you can put into motion right away. But she's also got an online course starting called the Money Mastery Course. And then she's got this awesome thing that happens every day, which she pretty much gives away um, called her ATM, which is Abundance Tips and Mentoring. Um, I don't know how she does all this stuff, you know, probably because she can't not do it, that fierce urgency of now. I mean, you know, Sharon is just putting stuff, content out, but stuff for, for us to grow every single day. Um, so on behalf of all of us, Sharon, all of the people that are at different phases of greatness and belief in themselves and buying into things, you know, thank you. Thank you uh, to the Nightingale for for all of the work that you've done in overcoming adversity and turning it into great things, being in dark places and rising up. Um, because as a result of it, not only are you having this amazing experience, but so are we. So I want well, to thank, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you mentioning the ATMs. Um, you know, think about ATM at banks. Well, this is for your mind and it's abundance tips and mentorship. And it actually, I launched it when COVID hit. I was so disgusted with all the negativity and all the fear that I said, okay, what can I do? And usually when I get mad about something, I do something. So I launched the ATMs as a daily message of positivity, a daily vitamin for your brain to make you understand that you are fabulous and you are perfect just the way you are. And sometimes we can get ourselves pulled down so quickly by, by all the negativity around us. And I just want you to seek out that positive side. So yes, the ATMs are very inexpensive. It's just basically covering the administrative costs. But every single day, I'd love to share with you something that's going to get a little giddy up in your step. And I end every one of them with you saying, I am fabulous. And yes, you are. So I love it. I love it. Um, you know, just I ironically, the, the Rise Up With Dragon podcast um, started in the same light. It was just me recognizing some pain um, in myself and others. And I started to do this every day. And I did it for a long time with the intention of doing it every day for the rest of my life. But now it's at a, uh, at a I'm 50 and I do it twice a week <laughs> for, for everybody. Um, so awesome. Thank you so much, Sharon. What a delight. Um, I'm so excited that I have somehow in my life created a situation where I bump into people like you amidst the 7 billion. Um, and uh, that was a great day for me and uh, for all of my listeners. So thank you so much and have a wonderful, wonderful day. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. And everybody watching and listening, you are fabulous. Awesome. I love it. Well, everybody, thank you so much for uh, for listening. This has been a special treat. 
um, so many special treats. This is another one. Um, I love to quote my friend Nir Ayel, um, who says that remember something, the idea of learning, observation learning, um, and just like absorbing this information is actually another distraction in the absence of action. So take an actual action step right now and go get some of these materials, sign up for the ATM, um, any of that stuff. Do something with that feeling that you have right now because it's probably happening for a reason. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, and we will see you next time.